Yeah, it's a great pleasure for uh, us to welcome our guest speaker uh, today. So this is this talk is part of uh, our chemistry seminar series. Dr. Uh, Victor Bruce um, did his PhD in the solid state electronics at the Institute of Problems of Material Science of the National Academy of uh, Ukraine in 2012 and received his Doctor of Sciences degree in physics of semiconductors and dielectrics from Chernivitsky National University in 2018. From 2013 to 2020, he was doing research and teaching at Chernivitsky National University as assistant professor and at Helmholtz Centrum Berlin at, as Green Talents Fellow and Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow and the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, as a project leader at the Center for Polymers and Organic Solids, established by the Nobel Prize winner, Professor Alan Eger. Now he is an assistant professor at the Department of Physics of Nazarbayev University, and his research is uh, related to material science and physics of semiconductor devices. So his talk today uh, will be on novel organic and hybrid photovoltaic materials. So Victor, the floor is yours. I can share your screen. Thank you very much for nice introduction and an option to present my uh, research uh, on chemistry seminar. So. Uh, let me change the uh, so first I would like to show you the uh, like most common uh, organic uh, inorganic and hybrid organic inorganic type of solar cells and uh, uh, these types of solar cells represent most of the uh, solar cells which are available on the um, market nowadays and active research is going on in these directions. So as you may see that uh, all of these types of solar cells possess some um, advantages and disadvantages and it's quite uh, uh, natural that based on the functionalities like additional functionalities which you expect from um, solar uh, cells and like photovoltaic materials, um, you will pick up for some practical application different types of uh, these solar cells. In this uh, talk, I will focus my attention on organic and hybrid, organic, inorganic perovskite solar cells, and uh, more particular, uh, on uh, we will talk about generation recombination processes in organic solar cells at the first half of my talk. And the second half of my talk will be dedicated to uh, photo generation, um, no, for, for, sorry, photo degradation of hybrid organic and organic perovskites. So let us start with the uh, organic solar cells. And definitely um, we should introduce the organic plastic uh, semiconductors. So when we hear this word plastic, we usually have uh, associations with uh, insulators, like electrical insulators, because that's what our everyday experience tells us. However, there are some types of um, organic uh, materials like poly polymers uh, with alternating uh, double bone uh, where electrons are quite weakly bound and they can be delocalized all over the polymer chain. One of the uh, example is polyacetylene, and it's one of the first organic semiconductors reported in early 70s. Uh, and uh, maybe about 30 years after this publication, three uh, co-authors of this paper got Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, for discovery and development of conducting polymers, since they found really wide application in uh, different <clears throat> electronic and optoelectronic devices uh, and made a huge contribution on the development of uh, electronic material science. Uh, so in particular, 
uh, I had a, an honor to uh, meet in person and work for some time uh, in the same um, institution, uh, Center for Polymers and Organic uh, Solids, uh, with Alan Higer, Nobel laureate. He is a professor of physics, however, got Nobel Prize in chemistry and recently retired. Uh, but it was really an uh, interesting experience to uh, work with uh, the father of organic electronics. And uh, what is really nice about organic semiconductors is that in comparison to inorganic counterparts, uh, by adding different molecules, it's possible also to change their conductivity, so realize um, electrical doping. And uh, for instance, in our recent uh, study, we uh, explained the two-step mechanism of uh, doping conjugated polymers uh, by Lewis acid, and uh, in particular, this uh, BSF uh, small molecule. And we showed that it's possible to change conductivity of this um, organic semiconductors uh, by uh, many orders of magnitudes. Uh, we are adding a certain concentration of these uh, small molecules um, and realize electrical doping that definitely broadens uh, possible applications of these materials. So talking about organic solar cells. So here is uh, mm, some general schematic representation of an organic solar cell. And uh, um, you can see that we have some glass substrate, transparent conductive uh, layer, then um, electron transport layer, active layer, which is bulk heterojunction layer, and uh, some uh, pole transport layer with the back electrode. Uh, so, it represents like the structure to be more uh, clear how it realized. Uh, we have some anode and cathode with different work functions and uh, some active layer in between them. So this active layer is a bulk heterojunction mixture of two uh, organic semiconductors called donor and acceptor. We will talk about this a bit later. Uh, but this active layer is considered to be intrinsic semiconductor, not doped. And uh, under equilibrium condition, when we have the same Fermi level for all system, uh, <clears throat> because of initial difference in work function, we get some band bending in the active layer of this um, solar cell. And uh, since it's intrinsic semiconductor and we have uniform electric field between anode and cathode, this bending, band bending is linear. So this uh, slope in bands actually band bending, um, provides some driving force for separation of uh, photogenerated charge carriers. And that's the mechanism, uh, very uh, general mechanism of uh, producing some photocarbon. So here on this uh, part of the slide, we can see the uh, electrical uh, equivalent circuit of <clears throat> solar cells. We have some photocarbon generator. Then we have a diet. And this diet is responsible for the dark JV characteristics. So it's a rectifier. And then because definitely these devices are not ideal, we have some, some parasitic shunt and serious resistance. So that is a very general representation, electrical uh, circuit representation of a solar cell. Um, now let us talk about some key um, uh, parameters, photovoltaic parameters of a solar cell. And uh, uh, we should, so this is a uh, JV curve of uh, a solar cell under illumination. Uh, we can easily determine short circuit current, open circuit voltage. Um, so it's like maximum current, which can be generated by a solar cell in external uh, electric circuit, uh, like maximum potential difference, uh, which uh, the solar cell can uh, reach under illumination between cathode and anode electrodes. And also there is some maximum power point. It's like maximum output power, which can be generated by a solar cell. Um, so uh, this is the way how we calculate this parameter field factor. 
And this is the ratio of maximum output power to the product of um, short circuit current and open circuit voltage. So as you see, one of the key, like actually the most important parameter for solar cells is uh, photo conversion efficiencies, like performance of solar cells um, is defined by the product of all these main photoelectric parameters, short circuit current, VOC and field factor. And that's why um, like simple answer, how would we need to, what kind of materials we should pick up uh, and uh, how we design our devices. Uh, we want all these parameters to be as um, high as possible. And that will definitely allow us to um, make efficient solar cells. So talking about more specifically uh, about um, material science aspect of organic photovoltaics, it should be mentioned that from well, it's like early 2000 uh, up to something like 2016, uh, most of um, electron acceptor materials for this bulk heterojunction active layers were based on uh, fullerens. So it's some fulleran derivative uh, with uh, some attached chemical functionality, which allows uh, solution processing of these fullerens. And taking into account that fullerene by itself is already quite defined structure, you don't have many options to modify it. Uh, it was really difficult to tune properties of um, electron acceptors. And that's why most of this time, and this a steady increase in performance um, was realized by optimizing donor materials, some polymers uh, to match requirements of this acceptor material based on fullerene. However, somewhere in 2014, 15, 16, there was certain saturation of performance of organic solar cells at the level of about 11%. And it was considered that it's kind of some maximum which we can reach. However, um, starting from 2016, new type of so-called non fullerene um, acceptors were synthesized and uh, taking into account that it's not attached now to this well-defined structure of uh, fullerene, um, there are really a lot of possibilities to modify chemical structure of acceptors uh, by changing the uh, core of this molecule, changing heteroatoms, modifying some um, side chains um, and uh, so on. So that's why uh, by inventing these non fullerene acceptor materials, it was possible to tune its properties in order to fit requirements of uh, donor materials. And uh, that's why tuning was possible from both sides. And that re resulted in very rapid increase in uh, performance of organic solar cells. Uh, you can see that quite steep uh, increase starting from about 2016. Uh, and now it, this non fullerene state of the art organic semiconductors possess performance of about 18%, uh, which is uh, really uh, a remarkable achievement. And this performance continues to uh, increase. So as an example, I would like to show you some of our recent results in terms of um, modifying, slightly modifying chemical structure of non fullerene acceptors. So you see here on this slide three um, different non fullerene acceptors. And what is important that here only side chains are modifying. Uh, all like core and this uh, uh, end uh, atoms like fluorine, they all stay the same. Only uh, side chains uh, of these molecules are modified. However, such slight um, changes in chemical structure can result in quite a huge shift of the absorption spectra toward longer wavelengths. So we can uh, modify uh, quite efficiently uh, the band gap of these uh, materials. And that means, uh, first of all, we can uh, tune the properties of these uh, molecules, which will feed better to um, requirements of the donor material and result in high performance solar cells. But what is also very interesting 
we can open new possibilities for applications of such uh, materials in, uh, for instance, uh, near IR, like near infrared photo detectors uh, based on organic semiconductors, that was not possible because usually um, like conventional uh, organic semiconductors, they uh, absorb only close to visible range, but never in the near IR range. Uh, these uh, new types of non fluorine acceptors, ultra narrow band gap non fluorine acceptors, really open new um, possibilities for uh, different applications. Let us talk a bit more in details how these organic solar cells work. And um, first of all, it's necessary to underline that organic semiconductors and like polymers. Uh, they possess quite low dielectric constant. That means when we excite uh, material with uh, certain photon energy, uh, we form not free charge carriers as we usually do in inorganic semiconductors, but uh, columically bound uh, electron and hole pair. And it's called exciton. And um, since they are bound, they cannot contribute to charge transfer uh, in the, uh, oops, come back, sorry. Uh, they cannot contribute to charge transfer and photocard. So um, what happens with this exciton? Um, if it stays and generates in, in, let's say, donor material, uh, it cannot be split. So we cannot create free charge carriers. The, only mechanism to split this exciton is to allow this uh, exciton to reach the heterojunction interface between donor and acceptor. And because of quantum discontinuity at the homo lumo uh, levels, like lomo lumo of donor acceptor, homo homo of donor acceptor, uh, this energy binding energy of excitons can be uh, compensated by uh, this. Uh, offset at the heterojunction interface and uh, free charge carriers uh, can be generated. So a hole remains in the donor material and an electron goes into the acceptor material. Um, however, this is not so easy because there are certain processes which limit performance of this free charge carrier generation. First of all, uh, we have issues with the diffusion of this uh, exciton towards the interface. Um, diffusion lens of excitons in organic semiconductors is in the range of uh, 10 nanometers. That means that uh, all photogenerated excitons should be created not further than 10 nanometers from the interface. Otherwise, they will just recombine somewhere in the uh, material uh, of donor or an acceptor and will not contribute to photocar. Uh, that is realized by self-organizing of bulk heterojunction. Uh, so we have this heterojunction interface uh, everywhere in the bulk of the active layer. So this process is self-organized. We mix two materials uh, together, the spin coat, and um, for, uh, also we can manipulate this process with adding some solvent additives, uh, annealing, uh, post fabrication annealing, and uh, um, all efforts are put in order to make the optimized morphology, um, like bulk morphology uh, of this mixture of donor and acceptor. However, even if we have optimized morphology, uh, there is a certain mechanism of uh, losing these uh, photogenerated charge carriers. Uh, before they are separated from the exciton. And this mechanism of recombination is called so-called geminate recombination. Uh, geminate because um, we have this mechanism, uh, electron and hole created from the same act of photo excitation recombined with each other. So uh, that happens quite in a short time frame, uh, about 10, uh, about a uh, few nanoseconds. And um, uh, that also, uh, that mostly defined by the uh, offset between energy levels of donor and acceptor. 
So we want from one side to make it as large as possible to have a strong driving force to separate this uh, electron and hole. And from other side, we want to make this, keep this uh, offsets small because then it will define the effective band gap and will limit the VOC open circuit voltage of these devices. So if we make too much of over like uh, offsets here, uh, the uh, open circuit voltage by definition will not be high and that will limit our performance. So it's always some compromise uh, between uh, finding the right mixture of two donors and acceptors. Um, so let's say we overcome this problem and uh, we'll geminate recombination and then finally created this free uh, electron and hole. And then um, I, in ideal world, we would uh, allow them to uh, transport through uh, donor and acceptor networks and be collected by anode and cathode and form some uh, photocarbon, which can perform some useful work. However, in real world, we have additional problems. And that is so-called non-geminate recombination, which can be split in two most common uh, uh, types. It's bimolecular recombination, when we uh, have a direct meeting of two charge carriers at the interface of donor and acceptor of uh, electron and hole. And uh, so also could be called as band-to-band -band recombination. So it's fundamental feature of the material. If we can generate electron hole pair by absorbing light, it can also uh, happen that this uh, uh, electron hole pair meet with each other, recombine radiatively, and also generate uh, this photon as a result of recombination. However, there is additional uh, mechanism which is non-radiative recombination, uh, exa an example of non-radiative uh, radiative, uh, recombination mechanism. When we have recombination with deep traps in this, there are some defects on some impurities and uh, um, they also cause uh, these non-geminate recombination losses, uh, which ideally could be um, ign like ignored if we have ideal material without defects and impurities. But unfortunately, in real life, uh, we always have certain concentration of these deep um, traps. And the task for um, uh, specialists in uh, organic photovoltaics to make uh, devices with active layers with as low concentration of these uh, deep traps as possible. And uh, finally, if they overcome also these uh, options for non-geminate recombination charges are collected and uh, generate photocarbon. So this is a quite uh, detailed description of possible uh, electro, like photoelectrical uh, processes which are going on in organic uh, uh, solar cells and define their principles of operation. So uh, in order to translate this explanation of uh, working principles on some real uh, life characteristics, it's good to uh, show some set of GV characteristics, like GV curves uh, of uh, solar cells. And uh, let's assume that we have only bimolecular recombination, which is fundamental feature of the material, so we cannot skip this. Uh, but in that case, uh, we have very high VOC, field factor, and short circuit current. So geminate recombination, which is recombination of excitons before they split uh, into free charge carriers, uh, if we assume that it's field independent, will reduce only short circuit current and VOC. Uh, it's quite obvious because we will have just less uh, charge carriers which can participate in the formation of uh, photocurrent. And also uh, VOC will be smaller because um, lower concentration of photogenerated charge carriers will uh, result in uh, smaller splitting of quasi Fermi levels in the active layer. So then on, on top of it, if we add some shock lyric color recombination, like we are deep energy levels, then uh, we again reduce uh, uh, concentration of charge carriers which can uh, form uh, photocurrent. And in this case, we reduce all 
main photoelectric parameters simultaneously will reduce uh, short circuit current, field factor, and VOC. And of course, if we add up all these recombination losses together, um, we see that all these photoelectric parameters which define performance of a solar cell, they are significantly reduced and performance uh, is reduced even more than separate of each, um, uh, each of these uh, photoelectric parameters separately. So we definitely want really understand the mechanism of recombination losses, uh, quantify it and um, try to use this knowledge in order to make uh, recombination losses as uh, small as possible in order to get high efficient solar cells. So how do we approach uh, our step-by-step um, uh, -step investigation of uh, photoelectronic processes in organic solar cells? Definitely, we need to start with the generation. So we need to start with generation of excitons um, and in active layer. And for that, we use, uh, in order to quantify this, a uh, quite useful tool is uh, transfer matrix optical modeling. Uh, we can simulate optical field distribution within the active layer of a stack of um, organic solar cell device. And in this case, we take into account uh, optical constants, uh, like spectra of optical constants for each layer, uh, which is used in um, fabrication of the organic solar cell. And this transfer optical modeling um, takes into account uh, absorption and reflection and interference of all uh, incident and reflected uh, wavelengths uh, from each interface. So eventually we can uh, get uh, absorption spectra, reflecting spectra from each of the uh, layer in uh, the stack of the solar cell and calculate uh, spectrally and spatially distributed generation rate of excitons in the active layer. So this is the key information which we need, because based on this information, we can uh, calculate uh, the total amount per second per volume uh, of uh, photogenerated excitons under different illumination conditions. I, it could be either monochromatic illumination or also some um, uh, like uh, one sun, uh, so-called AM 1.5 illumination condition, which stands for atmospheric mass uh, 1.5. It's considered to be standard illumination conditions of our uh, sun uh, under uh, normal uh, operation of solar cells. So now already when we know this distribution, spatially and wavelength distribution of auto-generated excitons, we want to address geometry combination losses means uh, how many, so we want to answer the key question, how many of these photogenerated excitons will be splitted and uh, like to, to free charge carriers and contribute to photocurrent. So there are different approaches uh, to answer, to address this question. So one is to compare the saturated photocurrent, experimentally measured photocurrent of the solar cell, um, which takes into account this PG coefficient, which is pre, uh, geometry combination prefactor, shows uh, the ratio of uh, photogenerated precharge carriers to the photogenerated uh, excitons, and uh, compare it to theoretically, like numerically calculated um, maximum photocurrent, which uh, is based on uh, our generation rate profile calculated in the active layer, which doesn't take into account this uh, coefficient. Then the ratio between the saturated, experimentally measured saturated photocurrent and um, theoretically uh, calculated one will give us this um, uh, geometry combination prefactor. Uh, however, it could be in some devices that this geometry combination prefactor will be uh, field dependent. So it will be dependent on the uh, voltage applied to the electrodes of the solar cell. In that case, there is another technique which is called like fast uh, extraction uh, technique for, and based on the um, shining a very short 
laser pulse on an organic solar cell with some pre-bias, uh, which can be changed. Uh, then after a very short delay time, which is uh, uh, so small that charge carriers uh, cannot, as an exciton still cannot recombine uh, geminately, uh, we apply very, uh, sorry, that uh, short enough that uh, charge carriers cannot recombine non-geminately because geminate recombination happens within the time frame of uh, 10 to like nanoseconds and non-geminate recombination happens in the time frame of microseconds. So we have very small time delay within nanoseconds. We, uh, this non-geminate recombination already uh, uh, not yet uh, started and uh, geminate recombination already finished. Then we apply very large negative bias and with strong electric field inside this solar cell, we extract all uh, charge carriers in order to see how many of, uh, what is the ratio between the number of absorbed photons, which means number of um, uh, created excitons in the active layer. Uh, what is the ratio to the uh, number of charge carriers which can be uh, uh, collected by electrodes means uh, we also can determine this uh, geminate recombination prefactor, but that could be done at different biases, like pre biases, and check if we have some field dependence of uh, uh, geminate recombination prefactor. So once we know generation rates of excitons, exciton. Um, a recombination rate, which is determined by this geminate recombination losses, then we can address uh, non-geminate -geminat recombination losses, uh, means recombination of free charge carriers in the active layer. And uh, for this purpose, we developed this analytical multi-mechanism recombination model, which takes into account contribution from bimolecular uh, trap assisted recombination in the bulk of active layer. And also it's like my particular contribution to this uh, field was adding the um, uh, recombination rate, uh, recombination current caused by trap assisted recombination at the interface of active layer and different electrodes. Uh, by combining these three mechanisms of recombination, we can fit um, quite well uh, experimentally measured recombination currents in uh, all types of organic solar cells. And um, by fitting, we can determine some unknown parameters, uh, which define like quantitatively uh, determine recombination uh, losses via different uh, mechanisms uh, in uh, organic solar cells. So once we uh, determine all unknown parameters, we can analyze uh, contributions like voltage field dependent contrib contributions of different recombination mechanisms to the total recombination loss separately. For instance, uh, from there, we can see that uh, surface recombination plays a major role only at uh, VOC, at open circuit voltage, at maximum voltage, which our solar cell can reach and limits this open circuit voltage. However, it has um, very, like negligible effect on short circuit current. So on short, short circuit current, when we consider uh, quantitatively analyzed short circuit current of organic solar cells, um, definitely surface recombination can be neglected. And uh, by doing all this uh, research, we allow to broader the uh, understanding of the device performance and that could be expressed an example going from this simple equivalent circuit to this multi-channel uh, losses equivalent circuit, where we take into account different mechanisms and understand better the relationship uh, between chemical structure uh, of or donor receptor molecules, uh, device engineering, and device performance. Uh, so that helps to uh, provide more detailed investigation of their uh, characteristics and deeper understanding of uh, reasons why these solar cells perform not so well as uh, they potentially can. So with this, I would like to switch to another part of my talk. 
And this is uh, mostly really material science uh, study. Uh, so this is photo degradation of hybrid organic and organic perovskite. So you may consider that photovoltaic materials should be uh, stable for illumination, quite natural expectation. However, there are, there are problems with that for organic and organic perovskites, and let us talk about this. So perovskites, this hybrid organic and organic materials, is quite relatively new class of photovoltaic materials, and it consists of some uh, inorganic uh, lead iodide framework with uh, methyl ammonium uh, organic uh, framework in it. And uh, uh, such hybrid materials, so this is the most classical example. Nowadays, there are more complicated compositions, but most uh, of them, like all of the high performance devices, they always contain uh, inorganic and organic framework. They can vary slightly, but um, this is the key uh, feature of this uh, material. And it's one, actually only one uh, known ionic semiconductor with high photoelectric performance. Um, usually ionic materials are just dielectric, it's like some kitchen salt. But um, these unique features uh, of uh, this uh, hybrid organic inorganic ionic semiconductor allows to uh, make very high efficient devices with performance uh, already beyond 25% under standard illumination conditions. So, Similar to organic semiconductors, perovskites can be solution processed, so spin coating, which is really very nice uh, because you can fabricate them at low cost without vacuum technology. Also, uh, perovskite solar cells share a similar device character engineering as organic solar cells. So we have some perovskite active layer, um, all uh, transport layer and electron. Uh, transport layer. So what is making this uh, material so efficient in photovoltaics? Uh, why it performs better than uh, organic semiconductors at current stage and even better than many other inorganic semiconductors? Uh, so you may remember already this uh, plot with different GV curves. And because of large dielectric constant of perovskite material, uh, under photo excitation, we don't create uh, columbically bound uh, um, exciton, like electron hole pair, uh, but instead we create uh, free charge carriers. So we automatically get rid of this uh, geminate recombination losses. Uh, which is very, very important uh, contribution to high performance. Another factor, which is so known uh, defect tolerance, it is uh, shown that in uh, perovskite, uh, uh, hybrid perovskites, um, intrinsic defects like vacancies and interstitial of lead and iodine atoms uh, form shallow energy levels, which do not act as efficient recombination. Uh, centers. And that means um, that uh, even regardless high concentration of such in, uh, uh, intrinsic defects, um, they don't have a dramatic impact on the performance. So this contribution from shock lead hole recombination, like trap assisted recombination, uh, which follows shock lead hole statistics, are uh, also uh, quite low and can be neglected. So as uh, result, uh, we end up with uh, devices like spin coated, very thin active layer, about 300 nanometers, uh, and performance of more than 25%. So it sounds really great and very promising. However, in real life, again, we have problems. And the main problem for hybrid perovskites is photo instability, instability in general. So what happens uh, if we have such nice polycrystalline film of uh, perovskites and shine um, some uh, uh, sunlight on it, which contains a small fraction of UV and 
also some bigger fraction of blue light. Um, eventually, quite fast, uh, this nice film converts to just drops of lead on the substrate. And this lead is actually the only stable uh, material which uh, is in this Karolskite structure. Uh, this is really a big challenge. And uh, understanding of the microscopical mechanism for such photodegradation is very important. So that's why we uh, uh, were quite interested to understand this uh, mechanism. And for instance, um, this is one figure from our review paper, we, uh, which shows uh, T80 lifetime uh, for different perovskite devices uh, along their development along years. And also here we see how performance increased uh, over time. Uh, so T80 lifetime is uh, uh, time uh, during which 80% uh, of performance of initial performance of, of solar cells remains uh, after operation. Uh, so for, for instance, for silicon solar cells, this T80 time is about 50,000 hours. It's quite a lot. Uh, but reported values of T80 time uh, we figure out that there are like quite many publications where this uh, parameter is reported. However, as you see, uh, most of them are reported for solar cells which were kept in the dark, uh, not under illumination. That is definitely not working condition. Uh, at the same time, we have a bunch of reports on this uh, uh, T80 time for perovskite solar cells. Um, under illumination. And in this case, most of them, which are marked, uh, researchers intentionally blocked UV component of uh, sunlight, uh, which is uh, definitely not, again, not real working conditions because uh, we have this part of UV uh, spectrum in uh, sunlight, and this uh, should not be artificially uh, blocked. Uh, so Definitely, it's a problem. And initially, it was considered that uh, the main reason for this is the presence of oxygen. So it was considered uh, this photodegradation um, process is uh, oxygen catalyzed. And um, by proper encapsulation of devices, this should be potentially solved. However, uh, oops, they were shown uh, shortly after uh, these publications. Uh, that photodegradation uh, happens also in vacuum. So you don't need the uh, uh, presence of oxygen or water to uh, cause photodegradation of perovskites. It happens, this performance drops uh, even in vacuum under illumination. So our key interest was to understand this vacuum uh, photodegradation process. And for this purpose, we prepared some uh, hybrid perovskite uh, films, mounted them in a vacuum chamber with high uh, vacuum to be sure that there are no uh, uh, like oxygen or other contaminations, and started to monitor with mass spectrometer uh, what is uh, happening with the film. So we kind of monitor what is going out from the field in the vacuum from the field uh, in the vacuum chamber. Uh, so initially, when we have this film in the dark condition, uh, there is some baseline for this iron uh, uh, signals. Nothing is going on. And once we turn on the UV light with uh, this photon energy, uh, so it's actually it's a blue light. Uh, uh, we see that uh, all of a sudden, uh, different components of perovskite film uh, starts to uh, effuse uh, to the vacuum chamber. So uh, definitely there is some photo activated decomposition process. And in order to um, understand it better, uh, we uh, monitored separate um, uh, molecules like ion signals 
for uh, under different illumination conditions. So for instance, when we start with the UV light, 3.4 electron volts, uh, so here it's dark, nothing happening, and then we turn on the light. So we see immediately that uh, hydrogen is coming out from the sample, uh, deuterium is coming out from the sample, which we added intentionally as additional uh, raised uh, para, uh, element uh, to, to monitor the changes because deuterium mimics the uh, hydrogen uh, chemical uh, features. And also we see that very fast, uh, we get quite big si signal from methyl ammonium coming out from the uh, sample. And that most likely just comes from the surface, pre-surface area. But the main process, uh, we see that uh, methyl amine, so deprotonated methyl ammonium, uh, with some delay, uh, quite actively leaves the uh, film of perovskite. Uh, so now if we go to blue light, we see quite similar picture. We shine light and all these uh, processes uh, repeat. Uh, however, if we go to red light with 1.9 electron volts uh, photon energy, uh, this photo decomposition process doesn't happen. So definitely we have certain activation energy uh, which is required to uh, initiate the um, photo decomposition of perovskite in uh, vacuum. And uh, that is according to our limited valence, uh, we can claim that it should be at least 2.7 electron volt and, and, and higher. Uh, so also we did some after our absorption spectra before and after uh, photo degradation. Uh, and uh, we did it in vacuum and in a dry nitrogen atmosphere uh, to check what happens if we don't have vacuum, but still don't have any water and uh, oxygen. And uh, the ratio between this spectra, like these peaks uh, here, show that we lose the uh, NH stretching vibration mode, means we uh, deprotonate our methyl uh, ammonium, so from the uh, side of of uh, ammonium. Uh, so we lose NH vibration modes, uh, NH bonds. And um, in order to proceed further with the understanding of this um, photodegradation uh, process, we did uh, low temperature uh, photoluminescence measurements. Uh, usually what you can see in the literature is uh, photoluminescence measurements in this region of uh, self-absorption and where we get a peak of bend-to-bend -bend transition. It's very bright uh, and like very high intensity peak uh, for, for perovskites. Uh, however, uh, we wanted to learn a bit more and measured uh, uh, photoluminescence in the short wavelengths region and have seen reproducibly these uh, weak uh, signals in the uh, short wavelengths region. This is really not, uh, uh, trivial result because according to the band structure of inorganic semiconductors, um, if we excite uh, material with uh, photon energy larger than the band gap, uh, we get some hot uh, charge here, like electrons, which are excited from the balance band. They occupy energy levels high in the continuum conduction band and uh, similar, like very rapidly, uh, instantaneously almost, uh, happens thermalization. This excessive energy is released to the crystalline lattice of the, uh, in, uh, of the semiconductor material. And uh, um, these hot electrons cool down and uh, reside on the bottom of the conduction band uh, without any radiative transitions. So the presence of such peaks uh, at the short wavelength region means uh, that we have some uh, energy levels which can uh, be occupied by hot electrons and stay long enough to participate in radiative recombination. Uh, that means that uh, we have some issue with the um, correlation between uh, 
uh, like being uh, in resonance between energy levels of organic and inorganic frameworks of the perovskite material. So our hypothesis uh, was that uh, in this uh, hybrid material, uh, photo excited electrons uh, with uh, energy, like with photons, a photon energy larger than 2.7 electron volts uh, could occupy anti-bonding states of, methyl, uh, of ammonium uh, uh, molecule and cause this deprotonation process. Uh, since, as I mentioned before, it is a uh, ionic semiconductor, uh, when we deprotonate uh, methyl ammonium, it loses its electric charge and we get neutral species. And there is no forces which keeps this uh, uh, methyl ammonium, uh, methylamine molecules inside the crystalline lattice. So it just starts to um, diffuse out from the field. Uh, and we uh, initiate this process of photodegradation without uh, participation of any catalysts, like oxygen, for instance. Uh, obviously, that under um, in, uh, isolation, uh, these anti-bonding uh, bonding, uh, states uh, would be quite high in energy. However, because of um, the effect of crystalline lattice in the like, hybridization of these uh, molecule, uh, molecular levels in the crystalline lattice of perovskite, uh, it could be that uh, these antibonding states are located much closer uh, to the uh, top of the valence band and allow uh, population, uh, their population with um, hot electrons under illumination with uh, blue and UV uh, light of, X, uh, of uh, perovskites. Uh, so definitely I wouldn't like to finish my talk with such negative statement of fundamental uh, mm, non-instability of uh, for, uh, perovskite materials. So it's a problem which should be solved by replacing certain uh, organic components. But at the same time, uh, it is really amazing material and worth investigation. Um, one of the unexpected feature, which we have found like in the 2016, early 2017, uh, was the high proton uh, uh, radiation resistance of uh, perovskite solar cells. So uh, from one side, we have material which decomposes under just regular illumination and the regular sunlight. However, at the same time, we have shown that uh, perovskite solar cells possess uh, much higher stability in comparison to conventional silicon solar cell in terms of uh, res uh, radiation resistance. So as you see, uh, performance of solar or uh, of silicon solar cell drops up to 18% of initial performance at those about uh, like total uh, accumulated dose of 10 to 11 protons per square centimeter. And uh, uh, that happens with uh, uh, perovskite solar cell at more than one order of magnitude higher dose. Also keep in mind that um, because of this high energy proton, 68 megaelectron volts bombardment, uh, glass transparency of the glass ITO substrate drops quite significantly. So if we take into account reduction of the short circuit current due to darkening of the uh, glass substrate, uh, then photo current, if we cancel this uh, contribution of darkening um, the glass, because it's not damaging the perovskite um, itself. Uh, so the short circuit current should be at the level of 80% of initial performance uh, at those even higher, which is 10 to 16 uh, protons per uh, square centimeter. Uh, so we did additional study in order to understand what exactly is going on in this um, uh, material under proton bombardment. We had some uh, uh, control set of devices which were photodegraded just under normal illumination and irradiated set of devices which was photodegraded under the same conditions and initially was proton bombarded. Uh, surprisingly, 
uh, after such treatments, this uh, set of devices revealed higher performance than the control set of devices. And uh, it's really a complicated um, uh, story. Uh, so uh, probably if everything will work uh, fine, we will have a chance to uh, continue such research at, at NU and finally figure out what exactly is uh, going on and what is the nature of such uh, unexpected high radiation stability of this material. So definitely it has many surprises and uh, uh, worth very detailed investigation. Uh, so one of the uh, hypotheses for that, uh, under photo uh, degradation, we know that we have the protonation of methyl ammonium. Uh, molecules and uh, by products of this uh, uh, photodegradation uh, are shown to uh, create some deep energy level in the uh, band gap. And deep energy level, according to Schofield and Hall statistic, work as efficient recombination centers. So they really make our uh, devices uh, not efficient. However, as mentioned earlier, uh, intrinsic defects, which like um, vacancies and interstitials of iodine and lead create only shallow energy levels. Uh, so they don't participate in recombination. Moreover, they can actively participate in the passivating and uh, compensating deep energy levels. So uh, complexes of deep and shallow energy levels uh, may uh, exclude the first from uh, participating in uh, recombination, uh, therapy-assisted recombination processes. Uh, which is uh, definitely beneficial for organic, uh, for, hybrid, for hybrid perovskite solar cells. And uh, that's why, from our point of view, it's one of the reasons why the set of devices with uh, higher performance uh, was uh, irradiated and illuminated. Uh, and uh, only illuminated with sunlight uh, devices perform worse. So with that, I would like to finish my, my talk and express uh, some acknowledgments to um, professors Quen Guyen Kudarmo Bazan at University of California, Santa Barbara, Professor Norbert Nickel at Humboldt Center in Berlin, my collaborators at CPOS Center, and our international collaborators um, in this field of uh, organic and perovskite photovoltaics and also different funding agencies for supporting my research in different institutions all over the world. Uh, thank you very much for attention and uh, I will be glad to answer your questions. So thank you, Victor, for the fascinating talk. I would like to invite uh, people from the audience to ask you questions. Please unmute yourself. Any questions? Yeah. So, Can I ask one question? The limb, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. About the lead uh, absorbing the energy. Normally, lead is added to the, the glass to prevent, the, for example, X ray, right? Uh, in the X ray instrument. Yeah, is it the same right. mechanism that is? Uh, on the glass. I don't know what is the... Uh... Oh, but uh, so in, in the glass, when we add lead to the glass, we just make a special type of glass, which uh, does not allow or significantly reduces intensity of x-rays, uh, which goes through this glass. Uh, so it's uh, the mechanism of improving the absorption of x-rays. Um, it doesn't modify the features of radiation stability of glass. Uh, and in this case, we have energies which are like much higher than X-rays. It's like 80, uh, so 68 uh, mega electron volts uh, protons. Uh, so uh, they go through the film and substrate uh, without being absorbed there. But because of interaction with the material, if we uh, eliminate, uh, like radiate so, uh, silicon solar cells with such high energy protons, they create some traces of defects and uh, uh, these defects as re as re efficient recombination centers and reduce performance uh, drastically. However, um, 
somehow because of uh, first of all uh, chemical like crystalline structure and also uh, hybrid nature of this organic um, inorganic perovskites these traces which are also formed in the material of perovskite by high energy protons which goes goes through the material they do not cause uh, for the creation of these uh, deep energy levels and that's why performance is not uh, deteriorated okay i had a one more question uh, in the very beginning of your talk you showed the modification of the acceptor molecules yeah uh, sure just elongating the uh, the alkyl chains. Mm -hmm. uh, is it? I think it's uh, electronically. It cannot affect that much the the change. Oh, it's not. The, uh, is it morphological change you are expecting? Uh, well, morphological changes are also there. That's for sure. Uh, but let's come back. Yeah, here. So uh, yeah. we, so I believe that the responsible for change in morphological morphology is uh, alkene, like length of the alkene chain, uh, but also uh, the presence of this heteroatom, like oxygen, uh, causes the uh, change of the energy uh, levels, like homo lumo uh, energy levels. Uh, so most likely uh, this uh, oxygen uh, heteroatom is responsible for uh, changing the, the band gap. So I'm not okay. definitely a synthetic chemist. Uh, so my part was uh, with, related with making devices of these materials and showing their uh, capabilities in device performance. Uh, but uh, just to highlight this material science aspect, uh, it's what uh, you can do with quite slight changes in the chemical structure. And believe me that this um, change in the absorption spectra is, is really huge. Uh, um, it's a remarkable achievement to modulate absorption spectrum in such a broad spectral range. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions. So other questions, please? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, Victor. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not my area, but uh, I was just curious uh, as I was listening to your talk. So you mentioned that this new material, Scotic uh, 4F uh, and similar ones, have led to uh, increase in the performance of this type of devices compared to fullerene-based acceptors. Yes. So is there any um, scope for actually combination of these two. So for example, if you copolymerize fuller and derivatives into the Cotic 4F structure, so is there any scope for kind of additional synergy that can push the PCE a bit further? Or? So uh, that's very important uh, aspect of research in this field. So it's always uh, non-stop uh, search for new combinations of donor and acceptors, which can result in higher performance. So there are certain uh, factors. Uh, first of all, uh, we need uh, this proper energy alignment of donor and acceptor. First of all, we uh, have to uh, realize this discontinuity between LUMO and uh, of donor and acceptor and HOMO levels because without this discontinuity, we will not um, generate uh, free charge carriers. Second, the band gap of uh, each of materials that should be uh, shifted in that way that it covers uh, as wide uh, spectrum as possible, because that will define uh, external quantum efficiency spectrum of solar cell, and eventually will define how uh, much of photocurrent it will be generated. But at the same time, besides these requirements for energy parameters, we need to think about self-organization of this uh, bulk heterojunction interface. 
there are certain types of materials which match perfectly in energy parameters and <clears throat> perform well in terms of generating um, free charge carriers, but they are not good in terms of ratio of surface energy and some um, uh, alignment of molecules with respect to each other. Uh, in that regard to make either uh, like perfect uh, bulk heterojunction, it could be either too big domains of donor and acceptor or too small domains. So if we have too big domains of donor acceptor, excitons cannot diffuse to the interface and they are lost. If we make too small, if it's degree of mixing between uh, donor acceptor is too high, then these networks of donor acceptor are too small and uh, we cannot realize efficient extraction of charge carriers from the active layer. So as a result, they just recombine instead of uh, geminately, non-geminately, and eventually we don't have high performing device. So it should be really a very uh, uh, edge <laughs> and compromise between these requirements. So uh, in, in this aspect, uh, another related question would be um, how the photoconversion efficiency depends on the uh, surface roughness of the boundary between the donor and the acceptor. So, so obviously, uh, yeah. charge transfer would be proportional to the area of this interface. So, if you are at the moment, sure, here, sure. So, is there so, any scope to uh, like change the performance of your device in a positive way by roughening up of this surface or creating a pattern? Between the and the uh, so creating, yeah, yeah, definitely you are right that uh, there is a dependence of performance and uh, uh, surface area of this bulk uh, heterojunction. Uh, <clears throat> it is very difficult to uh, control it reproducibly because as I mentioned, it's self-organized process. We just mix two materials together and hope for the best. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, we do not make patterns because those uh, resolution for patterns, which would be capable of doing, they are not enough to make a good uh, bulk heterojunction uh, morphology uh, because we are talking about uh, domains in the um, range of uh, 10, 20 nanometers it's quite a challenging test to make it uh, intentionally. So uh, we, and again, it should be like uniformly distributed in within the volume of the active layer. Uh, so there is an option to make some minor changes of the morphology and uh, um, uh, some of them can be really efficient because, uh, so the most efficient approach is uh, solvent additives. So we usually use chloroform and chlorobenzene to dissolve these materials, but then by adding some solvent uh, additives with high boiling point, uh, we allow this evaporation of solvents to happen longer and definitely that results on the uh, donor acceptor uh, phase separation in the field. Uh, there are some devices, some combinations of donor and acceptor materials which cannot operate efficiently without any solvent additive. So without solvent additive, it's like 3%, with solvent additive, it's 15%. So that is uh, makes a dramatic difference um, in performance. Uh, also, another approach is post-fabrication uh, approach. It's either just annealing in dry nitrogen atmosphere, which can slightly change the morphology, uh, or uh, solvent annealing. So we have some vapor of solvents that kind of facilitates re rearrangement of this um, donor acceptor uh, morphology. Uh, but uh, to really know exactly what we are doing uh, in by adding uh, and uh, post-processing, uh, that is very challenging because this in any way at the end, it doesn't matter what we do, we can affect the process, but Eventually, it's self-organized process. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions?
So I have one concluding question, if there are no others. Uh, so, you know, Pip, you're talking about these things made on glass uh, and IPO. So, but uh, people, yeah, right? one second. There is. People are yeah. trying to do this on flexible substrates, like a polymer films. Uh, yeah, so sure, sure. We, so we, we uh, have quite one example of this, like a polymer. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, so so. So, do you um, can can you elaborate about uh, how the radius of curvature of the bending of this uh, material after it has been produced in a flat state would uh, yes. from the photo conversion efficiency? So, for example, mm -hmm. you can imagine that if you bend this layer, so some fracturing may occur in each of these layers and these uh, stresses can accumulate at the interface between the donor and the acceptor. Is there kind of some clarity how this may... Uh, yeah, uh, sure. We, we definitely, the, these processes are definitely happening. And I particularly didn't work with flexible substrates. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that we'll not do it in the future. Uh, and uh, it's one of the key uh, requirements to test for, for bending uh, and its effect on performance. Uh, what I would like to underline here that uh, plastic organic semiconductors, they inherently possess this feature of like flexibility. Uh, so in terms of affecting the active layer, it's not so dramatic. Uh, they should be quite uh, tolerant to this bending. Uh, however, there could be issues with the interfaces. That is definitely the uh, key uh, point to pay attention uh, because uh, if we damage the interface, we'll get surface recombination and that will kill the device performance. Uh, also, what is interesting to mention in this aspect, uh, it is intrinsically uh, flexible but most of organic semiconductors are not intrinsically stretchable. Yeah, so this, this requirements for chemical structure, which uh, provides high conductivity, uh, does not correlate well with the requirements for high stretchability. And there is a like, big field of possible applications uh, in stretchable, like some medical implants and uh, stuff like that. So it should uh, mimic uh, skin, like human skin, uh, so that's uh, another challenging task to um, address. And uh, recent studies have shown that uh, non-foreign acceptors uh, with certain chemical structure, uh, they can actually help with this stretchability of bulk heterojunctions in comparison to fuller and base bulk heterojunctions. So they are more brittle. Uh, however, it's still under a very early stage of, of investigation. Oh, thanks very much. This was very interesting. So if uh, we don't have any other questions, so I would like to thank our guest speaker. Victor, thank you very much for your effort. And thank you for attention. Oh, it was a great uh, pleasure having you in our previous seminar. Yeah. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thanks. Bye -bye.